As gunpowder cannons took over from trebuchets, the old-style medieval forts started to fade away. That's when these curious star-shaped forts started popping up in different cities. But what made them special? And why did they replace castles and walls? Well, these forts were basically an upgrade of the old medieval defenses in the 15th and 16th centuries. You see, back then, big cannons and bombards were getting really good at smashing down walls. Take Mehmed II, for example. He rolled up to Constantinople in 1453 with over 100 cannons, including one monster called Basilica that could lob 450 kilograms projectiles two kilometers away. The Turks broke through the city walls, and folks realized they needed a new plan against gunpowder weapons. So they started sticking cannons on top of walls and towers to shoot back at the attackers. However, the walls were often too narrow for big guns, and they were positioned so high that they couldn't shoot back effectively. So people started putting guns lower down, adding artillery towers and bulwarks. These changes eventually led to the creation of the bastion, but we'll get into that later. In the early decades of the 15th century, Christine de Pizan described several modernizations that would make castles more resistant to cannons. One solution proposed was the construction of an additional wall some distance from the first, filled with earth to absorb cannon shots. Deep ditches were to be dug in front of the walls, and the walls themselves were suggested to be built in a wave-like shape to enable crossfire. But the evolution took a slightly different path. Thicker walls were made after the first siege of Rhodes, with some preferring to thicken them entirely with stone. Not only did the height of the walls decrease, but so did the towers, which used to rise above the rest of the wall. They could be filled with earth and gravel, leaving only the top floor usable as an artillery platform. This is Chateau Pontivy, built between 1380 and 1485. The wall shown in the photo collapsed due to flooding, allowing us a glimpse inside. Here you can clearly see the filling used to reinforce the wall. Another innovation in fortification design was the use of deep moats. Sometimes you can observe how the wall seems to sink into the moat, a tactic employed to prevent projectiles from hitting the base of the wall and to create a more challenging obstacle for assaulting infantry. Additionally, traditional crenellated walls posed a danger to defenders when hit by projectiles, so they were eventually replaced by solid barriers with embrasures. Here is an image of Fort de Salles, built between 1497 and 1500. It blends into the surrounding landscape, creating a low profile with a deep moat and towers of equal height encircling it. This design makes it resilient to cannon fire, while providing ample platforms for defenders to shoot from. This photo shows the Aragonese Castle in Taranto, most of which was constructed in the last decade of the 15th century. In this case, the towers and bastions are armed with an additional array of cannons. In many other aspects, it resembles Fort de Salles. However, the defining feature of the classical star fort was introduced precisely in the 16th century when forts adopted triangular bastions. In the early 16th century, Italy witnessed the development of the first angular bastion, making the Italians pioneers in creating a new type of defensive structure. Bastions are angular projections extending from the walls with an independent block between them called a ravelin. Sometimes additional artillery platforms called cavaliers were built above the bastions. The sharp angles of the bastion were designed to deflect cannon fire and the walls were faced with stone or brick and filled with earth and gravel. The star fort was armed with cannons as its primary defensive weaponry. The idea behind it was to overcome the dead zones inaccessible to defenders' cannons in traditional castles with towers. To address this, bastions were created, allowing crossfire between them. Each bastion covered the entire moat and two adjacent bastions, effectively providing mutual cover along the entire perimeter of the fortress. When star forts first appeared on the battlefield, they were practically impregnable to the bronze cannons of that time. Storming them without breaches was suicidal. Attacking such fortifications required meticulous preparation. The primary means of taking bastion fortifications were parallel and zigzag trenches. If you've ever delved into bastion fortifications, you've likely come across the name Sebastian Leprestre de Vauban. He's usually renowned as a highly influential military engineer who designed various forts. However, he was also a pioneer in the art of besieging impregnable forts. Vauban implemented a system of storming fortresses using what are known as parallel trenches, which shielded sappers from enemy artillery fire. The first trench was dug at the maximum cannon range from the fort. 
From there, another trench following a zigzag pattern extended perpendicular to the fort where construction of a new parallel began, and so on. Through these channels, troops could move relatively safely without fear of the defender's fire. A vivid example of this innovative approach is the siege of the Dutch city of Maastricht in 1673. So, here's how it looked from the perspective of the besiegers. Vauban formulated the principles and refined the art of siege warfare by developing tactical frameworks for the assaulting troops to adhere to. He also proposed allowing the garrison to surrender if a breach was made in their walls to avoid unnecessary bloodshed. When the besieging army arrived at the scene, the cavalry would first encircle the city, blocking all routes and roads leading into it. Once the attacking side was told to go to hell, the invading forces would construct earthworks at a distance of 2,400 meters from the defensive structures. The first line, called the circumvallation, was meant to cut off the besiegers' rear in case the enemy attempted to rescue their comrades from outside. The second line, known as the contravallation, provided protection for the besiegers against sorties from the fortress garrison. Supplies and equipment were typically stored between the lines, and the troops set up their camp. The camp served as strategic points within the lines and functioned like many forts. After a thorough examination of the defensive structures, the commander would select a vulnerable point in the fortress as the target for the attack. It typically consisted of two bastions and a ravelin between them. Two zigzag trenches were dug toward the chosen defense area, and at a distance of 600 meters from the covered path, the first parallel was excavated, providing a base for the initial battery positions. These batteries unleashed ricochet fire on the faces of the chosen bastions to suppress the fortress's artillery, limiting the defender's ability to fire on the trenches. Now, two zigzag trenches extended from the first parallel, and the second parallel was dug 320 meters from the covered path. Artillery batteries placed here complemented the work of the batteries in the first parallel, but more effectively. From the second parallel, three trenches extended further, two of them directed toward the tips of the bastions and the last towards the ravelin. At a distance of 30 meters from the covered path, the third parallel was dug, forming a platform from which the assault on the fortress would begin. This tactical approach would also find its reflection in the tactics of World War I. Currently, the besieging forces are almost within arm's reach of the fortress. They will attempt to clear the covered path by throwing grenades, and once it's in their hands, they can secure it. The sieges of the French city of Lille in 1708 and Maastricht are examples of intense battles for control of the covered path. Once the assaulting forces take it, they will install artillery batteries that will bombard the faces and flanks of the bastion and ravelin until they form a gradual slope creating a passage. Vauban preferred the defenders to surrender before this point to avoid bloodshed. In the future, with the introduction of rifled artillery and explosive shells, star forts would give way to polygonal forts. But that's a whole different story. Let me know in the comments how you would capture a fortress using wrong answers only.